so much, Marilyn. And so one thing, feel free to interrupt me at any time during this presentation. Um, I'm going to cover a lot of different things. And if we dive into one topic and go far on it, I'm happy with that, If even if we miss out on other things. So anyway, my name's Mike. I'm a PhD student in the Kinesiology and Health Science Department at Utah State University. You have to excuse me, I'm recovering from a cold as of yesterday, so excuse my voice. Um, and today I just wanted to cover some of the, my biggest takeaways from um, the ACUE course on effective teaching and practice as an office instructor. So, oops. <clears throat> so the overview of this presentation kind of has four main areas. So ideas on how to develop an orientation model, uh, tips for organizing your learning management system, guidelines for designing a transparent assignment, and then tactics for using your course data and feedback to better mentor your students. And so real quick, what is ACUE's course on effective teaching? So the Association of College and University Educators has this great course um, that a cohort of USU faculty got to go through last year. It's a year long course It has five focus areas that you can see outlined here. And then within there, within each focus area, there's about four to seven modules you had to complete. So is anyone currently enrolled or has taken ACUE? That's a part of this. Maybe, well, ho hopefully you, you get to be a part of it because it's a great course. But anyway. I have, Mike. I have, Mike. have Yeah, and there are several on here that are in the cohort and I'm facilitating this year. Okay, so there's a lot of people in it right now. Oh, someone's in the chat, currently enrolled, Doris. Okay, awesome. So you, you'll be familiar with some of this stuff already then. So I just wanna pause and ask you guys a question before we jump into the first orientation module part of what steps do you take to ensure your students start your course strong? So like sending something like a welcome message or uh, uh, an announcement post, what do you do to make sure your students know what to expect or what to do in the first week of your course? Feel free to jump in the chat and answer. Perfect. Marilyn has a good suggestion. Make a video walking them through the course navigation. Myra, I, I don't, maybe I'm probably messing up your name. Please jump in and tell me how to say it if I said it wrong. Walk them through oh, navigating the course as well. Yep, great, great example. So we will talk about that, but I'm gonna talk about a few other tips that I picked up from ACUE as well. So along with teaching your students actually how to navigate the course, some other ideas you might do is actually develop a whole orientation module where in the first week of the course, you're just walking them through how to operate your course, the syllabus, having a, a, a syllabus quiz and whatnot. But one thing that's simple and you can do beforehand is just send your students a welcome message. So a few days or a week before the class starts, send out a message to your students, letting them know the expectations in the first week, introduce your syllabus, just generally prepare students to start your course. I'm sure you've been a part of a course where in the first week you do absolutely nothing besides like talk about the syllabus. And then other classes, the first day of the course, you jump in and you're already like taking lecture notes. So clar clarifying that for your students with this simple message would really help them out. And I'm actually gonna drop a link in the chat later with a template you could use for a welcome message as well. So the other thing I included in my orientation module was the syllabus activity. And how I did this was just creating a Canvas quiz where I had my students basically just find pertinent information like, how do I contact my instructor? When are things due? When am I expected to submit my discussion posts? And where do I go for IT help? But Think about the questions that you get the most at the beginning, beginning of your course pertaining to the syllabus, throw those in a Canvas quiz and have your students do that for their, 
for a couple participation points or something like that. It will save you a lot of time in the long run. And also it will make sure your students at least know where to access the information they need that is in the syllabus, or at least acknowledge that they've looked at the syllabus once. And then, and then next up in my, in, my, um, in, in my orientation module, I included an introduction forum. And this is a great place to provide students the opportunity to get to know each other early on in the course so you can foster that uh, learning community. And then finally, it also gives you a chance to understand where your students are coming from. So I'm sure you've been a part of it in a, uh, a forum like this. Where are you from? What's your experience with the course topics? Um, so on and so forth. So just get to know you, especially in an online course, this is really essential. Try to get your students to include a picture or maybe a video so you can put a picture with the name and the class becomes a bit more personable. And then finally, the last thing I included in addition to my uh, course navigation, which I'll talk about later though, um, was setting clear course guidelines. So a lot of the, a lot of the examples I'm using in this presentation pertain to an online course, uh, asynchronous online course, but setting up your guidelines could be used in a synchronous course as well, especially when there's communication going on line between people or in the classroom when you're discussing things. So just setting these expectations or even bringing up some initial expectations like the ones you see on your screen, having a discussion about it in class and seeing if there's any, any more expectations you want your students to add or clarify or edit so everyone has a voice and everyone can have respect for one, one another in the class and things can roll smooth. So is there any questions about the orientation module before we, we move on? Do you guys need any examples from that? I can pull things from my course and show you at any point too if you do. So feel free to let me know. If not, there's a lot of information so I'll try to roll through it, but feel, feel free to interrupt me. So moving on, so think about the best class and the worst class you've ever been in in respect to how the learning management system was set up. So in the best class you ever had, how was the Canvas course set up? Was it easy for you to use? Why was it easy? In the worst class you ever had, why was the learning management system so frustrating to use? Can you guys provide me some of these? Does anyone have an example? Uh, yeah, I, I, I remember in one of like the worst courses I did, um, there was just like lots of uh, links that just led to like nothing. And then so it just really cluttered um, uh, the whole Canvas page and it was really hard to find what you needed to find. And so you'd have to spend a lot of extra time when you ever were looking for something new. Yeah, so in broken links, inconsistent organization, it sounds like. Um, Leanne says, best class, clear, consistent expectations, variety of learning options. Um, yeah, organized learning activities. Worst instruction from Jeff, uh, instructor clearly didn't have an understanding of what the LMS and hadn't uh, didn't how, know how to use the LMS, dumps material, lengthy announcements. Yeah, it goes on and on, right? But there are a few steps we could take to just make this easier for our students, right? And we a lot of a lot of you already brought up a lot of the things I'm going to talk about. So here are a few tips that I gathered from the ACLE course. So first off, organize your course from a student's point of view. On your homepage, make sure the things that students need to access are easy to access. Have a start here page so people know how to use your Canvas course right away. Have your syllabus on the homepage. Um, have the Canvas help and additional resources. Whatever you need is right there on your homepage. Um, the biggest thing I probably learned from AQ is on this slide right here is building consistent modules within your learning management system. So like Jay said, broken links or 
misorganized content, like I'm sure we've all been in a course where sometimes the files you need to access are under the files tab. Other times they're on some page and some module that you have to click six times to get to and find. But if you, were to, if you can build, if you can start by just building one module that is really consistent, and then from there, make all the rest of your modules reflect that first one so students know what to expect, where to find the information, and they can access it with ease. So within, with ACU, you had a very similar setup to what you see here on the screen. So this is a module from one of my courses. So I had these different tabs here where the first section is engaged. So under there, I have two pages. The first one is just a two minute video of me introducing the module. The next one is the learning objectives. Then I have the listen, watch, learn section. This is where students are viewing demonstration videos of the topics, either from videos I made or YouTube or elsewhere. One sec. And then next up, I have learning, their learning resources page. And this is where students can access text, um, text, podcasts, articles about the topics as well, as well as Canvas pages that I've made to outline kind of the major topics from that section. In the next section, which I've labeled deep in thinking, this is where students actually interact with the content that they've learned about previously. So in this, this section, I usually had a like this one with a listen and discuss. So I had students listen to a podcast and then draw on their personal experiences with topics about the podcast and draw those together with topics they've learned earlier in the class. So that was a really good section for me to add additional information to my students as different topics came up in the chat. In the practice and reflect section, you can have students go back and draw on the information they learned, give them a chance to practice questions they might see on the exam, or just one more chance to interact with the material in this module. So this is a great section to use something like an atomic assessment and build like a lab where students, like I said, can do things like, I, this was an anatomy kind of class. So I would have say pictures of a leg bone and circling certain processes in one color and then outlining um, different layers of bone in another. And it's more interactive experience for students if that was an online class, so obviously in person, you can do it a little different. And then finally, the close section minute survey that I had students take each week, which I will talk about in, uh, in a few slides ahead. So yep, like M Marilyn mentioned earlier, developing a course navigation tutorial, showing how to, how to navigate your course and where to find important resources and what to expect week to week is so important as well. So this was something that I actually had in my orientation module, but setting this up and setting those expectations for your students is really key. And then also this got brought up um, in the best class, students were offered different learning resources. And th this can be drawn over to assignment types and submissions. So having a choice is motivating. So when, you, when you're able to say, choose which article you get to summarize in a research project. It's a little bit more motivating than being assigned a certain topic, right? So whenever you can, when, you when you're um, giving your students learning resources, try to share not just readings, but share readings, videos, websites, podcasts on the topic whenever possible. This will give students, if they have different learning styles, the chance to maximize their learning, or if they just wanna run over the information in a different way, it's available to them. This can also be applied to assignment types, like I said, offering students on um, different choices on discussion prompts, like, hey, choose between one of two discussion prompts below and then respond to your class. Or types, as, uh, types of assignments. So it could be, you know, uh, you could record a video or you could um, hand in a written paper. So how you submit it can be, can be um, changed to, and it can, ask students to kind of step out of the comfort level and do something a bit different. So it can be a fun way to mix it up for your students as well. It is a little bit more work for teachers potentially, but sometimes using things like video submissions actually, I think saves time. And so now we're gonna, any questions about um, kind of maximizing your LMS for student learning? 
before we move on to the next section. How are we doing on time? Okay, well, save questions for the end then. Okay, so next up, I wanna talk about some guidelines for developing a tran transparent assignment. So who's, so the first thing I wanna talk about is chunking your assignments into standalone tasks. So by show of hands or a yes in the chat or something like that, who's had an assignment where you've had to summarize a bunch of research about a topic and submit a paper that contain, do like a, re, like a research review paper that includes multiple sources. Okay, Leanne, yeah, I'm sure we've all had this. It's a big task, right? It has a lot of different moving wheels. And I think we sometimes assume that our students know how to do all of these tasks and we just chunk it into this one big final project. And I don't think we teach our students as much as we could by doing that. And by chunking our assignments into these smaller tasks, we can spend more time on each topic and really make sure students know, or we, or we make sure our students know or have the background to actually perform each of the tasks in the final task of the project. So in my, in my class, what I, I had this research assignment, right? I want to do that research review paper where students had to support a controversial topic with five articles of cited of research, right? And so rather than just that one big top, one big paper, I broke it into the first thing was just having students summarize research. And I showed them how I summarize or how I would read an article and summarize it and share it back in a in a like less than a page. So I share, I, that was the first assignment. So assignment one was summarizing research. The next assignment, I broke it down. Or the next assignment was locating research. So how do we go out? How do we use the search engines? How do we find reputable sources? And then finally, the last one was citing and compiling research. So how do we read an article and actually pull pertinent information from multiple articles about certain topics and then piece that all together into one big paper. So rather than one big assignment, chunking your assignments down, you can spend more time actually teaching your student the process of each of these big processes that go into the overall research assignment. And so the next thing that is essential for learning is actually Part of that is the assignment is modeling to your students how you would actually do the process. How would you do the assignment? Show your students, think out loud, you know, communicate what is fully needed to do the assignment and show your students your process, show your students your process so they can start to develop their own process. So a lot of times um, you can just do a screen recording video. Say you're, you're doing a little writing video, how to summarize, like the video I did for how to summarize an article. Just as you're reading an, read an article out loud, say with your class, and then um, think out loud, think, pull certain information out and show them what you would do. And this would go for anything you're trying to teach. Next, be be transparent about the purpose, the task, the skills required, the criterion for success, and, the, and provide an example of a complete assignment to your, to your students. So this was a template that was provided to us in ACOE, which will be in the file I'll drop in the chat at the end here. And basically it's just showing your students a little bit more than just the instructions for the assignment, right? You're telling the purpose, the skills they're gonna need to do it, um, and then you're actually going to provide them with an example of what a completed, a completed assignment looks like. And obviously you don't want to complete, show, have a, an example that's right on topic with a topic they're going to choose. So try to ch choose something off topic, share with them, but something they can see how you've done it as well. But I thought this was a great, a great template to use to just make sure your, your assignments are really clear on what you're expecting. And then to further clarify that, make sure you're including a rubric with your assignments. There's a great tool on Canvas where you can build these out in no time flat and include them on any assignment or even discussion. So this was a, a discussion a, a rubric I used. So just the different, different posting guidelines in there as well. So just to clarify your, expectation, your expectations, 
use the rubric whenever possible. This will also make your grading much more objective. And so before we jump into the last section, how many out, how many of you are teaching this semester by, by show of hands? And then, and how have you, how familiar you, familiar are you with the um, kind of like the the data tools in Canvas that we have access to, like who submitted an assignment and stuff like that, monitoring activity and misinformation and stuff like that. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So, so in Canvas, there are tools you can use to view who's logged in in your course. Um, how often students are engaging. And this is really useful to, especially in the beginning of your course or when students are coming to you saying, oh, I'm not doing so well. Well, if you can, if you, if you log in and you see that they're, they've interacted with your course for a total of, you know, one minute and everyone else is at multiple hours, that might be a sign right there what's going, going wrong with them. If you do upload your videos to your media page in Canvas as well, you can track the views you get on your videos, even if they're just uploaded from YouTube. So if you upload a YouTube link into Canvas, you can check and see who's actually viewing the videos you're uploading in your course, and are they getting utilized by all the students? And then this is the one I like the most for data feedback was, um, you can keep an eye on who has yet to submit an assignment or an exam, and you can um, quickly message everyone who has yet to submit and just send them a quick reminder. A lot of times students just forget and they really appreciate you just reaching out and giving them that quick reminder. So it's an easy tool that we can use to monitor our students' progress. And so now I wanna talk about the one minute survey that I kind of mentioned earlier that I included at the end of each module. So at the end of each of my modules, I asked students three questions. I asked them, what was most clear, helpful, meaningful in this module? What concepts or ideas from this module or unit are still unclear? And what additional comments, insights, or questions do you have about this module's concepts or ideas? I told them not to spend more than a minute on it, and it was amazing the feedback I got. Of course, some, some people just said, all good to all three questions and checked out. But I wouldn't say every student every time did that at least had an, a chance to interact on a one-on-one -on -one level with the questions or comments I was getting from these surveys. So a lot of times when things were unclear, it might have just been for one or two students. And that was a great chance for me to either set up a meeting with them to clear it up or um, shoot them a quick message to just clarify something for them. However, if I went through these surveys each week and noticed there was a topic that just about everyone was had some sort of misunderstanding on, this was a great chance for me to make a video to send out to the whole class and clarify that misconception that happened. And I thought that was a great chance to connect with my students and see where they were at. I also even had one of my students, so it was the first rendition of this class that I taught. So there were some spelling errors throughout the pages I created. And each week they would let me know um, any edits they had, which was awesome. You know, it, they were improving the class. And even the comments where maybe it wasn't something you could fix and address right then and there, you have all of this feedback sitting there waiting for you to improve the course for the future. So it's it's a great set of information. It's a great tool to use. And I did this um, 12 times throughout the semester. I never had anyone complain about it being too much or asking too much. So maybe that seems like a lot, but at least doing a few times throughout the semester, I think would be really beneficial. And so, oh, we have a question from Leanne. Did you do these one minute surveys in Canvas or, and did you assign points? Great question, Leanne. So yes, I, I created these um, one minute surveys in Canvas and let me see if I could show you real quick what one looks like. Oh, 
Liam, this is what they looked like. So really simple, just three, um, three, three questions set up as a survey. And actually, this, so this was a, for an asynchronous online course. And so each of these were with two points and they, they that counted as their participation points or like attendance for the course. So there was a little, just a little bit of incentive to complete it, but I never docked anyone if they put like just a whatever answer into the box, you know? Yeah, so that was kind of my, my presentation, um, I kind of, I feel like I kind of rushed through it. I was, yeah, I was sick yesterday. So it was, I'm just glad to be here, but I want to, I want to ask you guys, do you see yourself? Um, is there any piece of information? Oh, what is going on? Or sorry, what is one strategy in this session that you can see yourself imp possibly implementing into your classroom? Or is there something you want to talk about more? Or do you want me to show you an example of anything from the class? The rest of the time is ours, so let's just open it up to discussion. Mike, I have a question. It's it's Leanne here. Hi. Hey, Leanne. Hey, um, do you find um, your due dates to be similar in your modules, like every, you know, Sunday at midnight consistently every week, or do you group them in a larger period of time? Do you have any insights on, you know, student, student, student due dates or due dates for assignments? Um, yeah, I, I try to keep it just as consistent as possible. Like every week, everything was due at the same time. So students always knew what to expect. And in my comments from my feedback, they, they really did like that. I don't think there's ever a date that you can pick that's going to suit everyone the best. So I think just keeping the date consistent is the best. And then, you know, if some students need some leeway here or there on the submission, be lenient, obviously. But yeah, yeah. Have you had some struggles with that in the past? Um, a little bit. I I teach in person primarily, but I'm going to be doing an, a fully asynchronous course, and so I'm I'm just curious if students like a lot more flexibility, meaning due dates are every two weeks, right? So they can really monitor two week, or are they still prefer one week so they don't get behind. Just trying to think about uh, the benefits of an asynchronous course versus in-person and trying to, to kind of pace um, the course accordingly. So, and I guess maybe my question is, do you see all the submissions coming in right before the due date? Oh, so actually, no, I was, I was surprised. There was, it was, it was pretty predictable every week. Like there's always students right at, the, right when the assignment went up that would do it like you could see or, sorry I should start over you could see people's schedules right some people um only had the weekend to work on the course and then some people you could tell knock the, their courses out first thing in the week so it's kind of all over the place with submissions but of course yeah I would say about 50 percent submit right when it's due and on on that note I I taught this course previously and I completely redesigned it. Previously, I had a much less interactive course where, like you said, like things were due every two weeks or every three weeks, something like that. I think in an asynchronous online course, you do need at least some sort of weekly deadline or interaction um, to make sure your students are engaging with the content regularly or else they're just gonna engage with it when something's due. But if you have something due once a week, um, like in my class, I had a discussion board every week and everyone had to post their initial post by Thursday. That was mandatory. Um, and, you know, all the labs were due on Sunday night, so on and so forth. But students know what to expect and they still had enough flexibility in an asynchronous environment to do it on their own time, yet we could once a week and all talk as well. 
Thank you. Appreciate that. Does anyone else have any questions, comments? Hey, Mike, uh, I'll ask something quick if you still yeah. have time. Um, great presentation. Uh, uh, you just brought up um, using the discussions feature, and I was just wondering how that worked in general. Um, it seems like sometimes in the past, like Canvas discussions have been kind of clunky or it's hard to get students to really participate in them um, and what your strategies were for, for using that. Yeah, let me, let me uh, pull up an example real quick. Can you also see my screen? Hey, Jeff, can you still see my screen? Yep. Yeah, so each, each uh, discussion, I kind of laid out like this. So each week, um, there was something to engage with, like watching or watching a short video or listening to a podcast. Try to keep it, you know, nothing too long and somewhat of if I could incorporate some sort of controversial topic or something as the video, that would be the one. So for, for instance, this class was like about exercise performance and this discussion um, pertains to these exercise masks that are definitely controversial. And so in my discussions, I always tried to ask a question that pertained to whatever they were watching or listening to, um, something that would tie something, some tie to some information that was covered in the earlier in the module or the learning resources, and then something that drew on their experiences, um, if they use say the mask or something like that. So. That's how I got people to engage. So kind of using those. Also, I would do things like um, give a lot of choice in the videos they could watch. Let me see if I can find an example, like different videos or different questions they could, could answer to. Um, sorry, I'm not going to be able to find an example right now. But on top of that, I had really clear set guidelines on when people were to submit. And then I had the, the norm set for responding as well. And at the beginning of the discussions, I made sure to um, make sure to uh, message people that maybe weren't sticking to the norms or um, having them dial in their posting a little bit better. And the other thing I used was um, Travis, Dr. Thurston's um, digital power-ups. These were, um, a mixed review, but I think it's a good way to focus your answers. And I like using them. And I would try to um, form my responses using them as well to model it to my students. Great, thanks. Yeah. Well, Mike, we've hit our target time of 2.35. Okay. If you have any further questions with Mike, you're welcome to get on the Mighty Networking app and continue that dialogue with Mike and other um, uh, participants. I absolutely love the presentation. It was so helpful to finally see the hard work you had put in and were discussing in the AQ cohort last, last year. Um, I, I like the digital power-ups myself too. So, and I did learn from Mike how to write those in the cohort. <laughs> Thank you. We're it's going to- media. 
<laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> we'll be uh, continuing our next session, which will start really quickly at 2.45. So if you haven't responded to any, that would be great. Any of the other, uh, if you want to watch this again, we'll have more of the recordings available as soon as we can on the Mighty Network app and also on the ETE website. Have a great session and we'll talk to you soon. Bye everyone.